Sandro, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time and excited to talk about uh, Sanzo, your, your company. I would love for you to tell people what is this company, what are you doing now today with it? Yeah, so first off, you know, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Sandro Rocco. I'm the founder and CEO of Sanzo, and we're the first Asian-inspired sparkling water using real fruit plus no added sugar. So, um, you know, if you're used to drinking, you know, for any sparkling water fans, you know, you, you, you most likely have a beverage that has like a, a quote unquote natural flavor. So if you pour it out, it's like clear. Um, ours actually has color because we're using the real, um, the real fruit juice. And specifically our fruit inspirations are coming from um, the Eastern hemisphere, the, representing, you know, 60 plus percent of the world's population, but you know, you don't see it on, you don't typically see it on mainstream grocery shelves. So we're trying to, uh, we're trying to change that. And I always have to go back to the beginning. I think it's fun to kind of go from the early times. So for you, where did this idea come from in the first place? Yeah. So, um, it was around the middle of 2018 and I, you know, I, I live in New York city and, um, at the time it just felt like, um, a lot, like Asian things just kind of became cool, um, for, you know, you know, you know, a very simple way of putting it, um, you know, Crazy Rich Asians was you know the, the number one film at the box office. Um, but then even if you kind of dove deeper than that, though, it was, you know, there, there were a lot of restaurants that were, you know, perhaps a bit more Eurocentric inspired, flipping over and becoming more, you know, like, like Asian concepts were, were, were opening up. Um, when you read more food media, uh, or if, even if you were on your, um, you know, your streaming devices or streaming services, Netflix, Hulu, um, heck, even Spotify. Um, you know, if you just looked at a variety of, I'll say, like consumer products, and that could be physical or digital, um, there's just so much more of an, of, of an Asian inspiration. And yet what I found was there was nothing really in the beverage space um, that I felt was adequately representing that. And so, um, you know, I'd worked, I was working at a technology company at the time. Our fridges were stocked with um, a lot of sparkling water brands, um, but felt like, hey, there's some room here to do something, um, do something fun and you know, innovative as at least as far as the, the beverage industry goes. Um, and so that's kind of where the, the journey began. From that, then, so did you decide to start this on your own? Did you get a partner right away? Like, how did that go for you? I'm curious. Yeah, no, and it's a great, great question. Starting like all like the, the really nitty gritty there. So you know, I, I am the sole founder. You know, I did end up kind of going at it my own, my, you know, my, my own path. Um, had actually self-financed the business and moonlit for um, you know a year um, while at my day job before actually you know leaving and, and starting the business on my own. Um, you know, did talk about it with certain friends, um, certain other folks that I thought just might have been interesting to work with. Um, what I eventually learned though was just I don't know if it was my own personality or whatnot that like it just kind of needed to be me or either that or I just didn't find the, the exact right co-founder fit. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was me and actually, you know, I, I, I talk about how I, you know, the original idea came in 2018, you know, incubated and actually, you know, launched the brand, on um, the summer of 19, uh, I was the only employee until October, 2020. So, um, really did the, the, the solopreneur thing for, for quite a bit, but, you know, fortunately we do have, um, a bit of a team now starting to support us. In, in that year or so you're moonlighting, you're working your job still, and this is something a lot of entrepreneurs like do you take the jump right away and kind of go all in? Do you kind of work on the side what, nights and weekends for you in that year? Like what were some of the things you were doing? Like how far did you get in the business before you ended up going full-time into it? I mean, one of the things I found interesting about CPG or uh, packaged goods is that there's actually quite a fair amount of R and D that needs to get done before you really go to market. And uh, you know, a lot of that R and D time is uh, anyone will tell you it's, it's a lot of waiting. Um, you know, you put out, you, you put out specs or even you might, you might test out a formulation. Um, but then, you know, you, you don't get that feedback for, for, for a little bit, um, you know, for, for myself and, you know, for the, for this brand as well. Um, even if we had a formulation, like I would take that to farmer's markets on, you know, nights and weekends. So times that, you know, didn't have to coincide with a regular day job. So, um, you know, there's actually quite a bit that you could do in, I'd say, you know, the first like six months to maybe, you know, I probably stretched it going a full year because at the time we already had, um, you know, about like 15 or so, um, you know, clients, you know, like retail partners, you know, restaurants and independent food markets. And, um, you know, I would spend my mornings 
um, taking the subway or taking Uber pools at like 6 a.m. to deliver the product before going to work. So, um, you know, I, I definitely stretched it a bit. A lot of it, frankly, was I knew that this industry or, you know, when I started talking to, to folks who did specifically beverage, um, you know, they did, they did talk about how beverage can be a bit more of an expensive business, right? So, you know, unlike, um, you know, potentially a, a fully digital product, um, you know, we're not just spinning up, you know, AWS instances and uh, going from there, you know, the, the manufacturing a product actually does take a bit of a, a bit of capital. So, you know, it was really trying to be um, as scrappy as possible um, in the early days, just because we knew it was going to get expensive very quickly. <laughs> Yeah, well, of course. I talked to a couple of different beverage people on the show and it's just like, it's a lot to deal with in terms of obviously the product side of it, but also distribution. So let's start with the product side of it. How did you approach then who you're going to have actually create this product? How'd you go about that process for other people who are wondering, you know, trying to get into CPG? Like, how'd you even go about that? I came in with a true beginner's, I wouldn't even just say mentality, like, like, I'm a beginner and this is my first time ever launching a food and beverage product. So um, actually, I mean, I did what I, what I would hope, you know, a lot of your, like, whatever your listeners are thinking that I did probably did. So, you know, order purees off of Amazon or found other third party websites. Um, combined, the, the initial, the, the first few recipe, the first recipe iterations were actually my own um, off of a Google sheet and uh, a scale that, cooks would use in the kitchen, just, you know, like a, like a, a mass balance that you would use in a, in a, in a chemistry class. Um, so it was, you know, it was as rudimentary as, as that, um, you know, one thing you do learn again, pretty early on, if you are getting into this space is if you're going to have a product sit on shelf, you need what's called um, a scheduled process, which long and short of it is it's a food scientist who signs on your recipe saying that this won't, uh, harm anyone <laughs> um, from a food safety perspective. It won't rot. It won't, you know, cause anything crazy like that. And so, you know, you work, you know, hand in hand with someone there uh, with, with that scientist to get the, the process to, to the recipe to a point where they can sign it off. And they're actually very cheap resources. I mean, not to get too thick into the weeds of it, but um, Cornell um, University runs like a food lab. Um, if you're, if you're located in New York, and, you know, just to put some dollar figures out there, I mean, a, a recipe sign off is as cheap as like $200 to get that level of, yeah. So, I mean, you can go, if you're paying a formulator, if you're really going to commercialize it, you know, that can get you into the, you know, thousands of dollars. And I would argue when you're ready to, for, for prime time, it's actually worth, it's really worth actually, um, you know, paying those expenses. But in the earliest days, um, you know, you can, there are resources out there for folks who are trying to really scrap it because as much as the industry can be expensive as you're scaling in the earliest days, you know, it is a lot of, um, I, I'd actually say it's a very diverse founder set. I've actually found it to be very encouraging. You know, it's, it's a lot of folks who find maybe had, you know, a four-year college degree and worked in the technology sector, but it's also a lot of folks who maybe, um, you know, high school educated, just have an idea, you know, they're making a, a salsa or some kind of sauce or, or something that or a cookie um, that their friends and family loves. And now they're just, you know, selling it at and, and, and building out from there. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of a fascinating industry in the, in, in, in how, um, yeah, in, in just how diverse it is. <laughs> when you, when you say ready for prime time, that's the, the point where you may spend thousands of dollars potentially on someone like what, what do you categorize that as? Like how big do you look at that? Like when someone would potentially want to spend more than the 200 you mentioned instead of going thousands and going kind of all out on that, what, at what point do you think would that, would that be? Sure. I mean, I, I would say there are certain retailers that if they call you, um, you do not probably want to go to them with, um, you know, with something that can't scale is probably the best way to say it. So, um, you know, for us, it was Whole Foods. So Whole Foods and, the, and, and there are um, 13 regions in the United States. You know, us being in New York, our home market was the quote unquote Northeast region, which encompasses New York City and the, and the surrounding area. Um, it is, as you might imagine, the most competitive um, region. The good and bad, if you do well there, you know, it, it can kind of cascade into you know, you know, other regions, potentially, uh, if things go well, you know, a, a, a national distribution relationship, um, you know, uh, a Whole Foods level retailer also comes with them a, uh, you know, a nat like the nationally reputable distributors. Um, and in the food and beverage industry, um, you know, it, your distributor is, 
in many ways, just as if not even more important um, than the actual retailers that you're working with. And so the problem, what I would say is if you go to these kinds of um, you know, folks with um, recipes that don't scale or operations that are not you know, locked tight a bit more, it, it can literally end your business because if, if there are product efficient, if there are quality assurance efficiencies, you know, uh, certainly the worst thing you can do is actually cause harm to a customer. You know, you, you are selling food and beverage products. And so, you know, if you don't have that buttoned up and you're doing it at, at that level, you know, it's basically a death sentence for the business. So, um, you know, at that point, you know, that's why the industry can get a little bit expensive because you do have to take a bet, you know, at a certain point that we are going to be a bigger brand. And so um, you, you do have to put those resources in to, um, you know, commercialize your your recipe and your brand. At, at what point then for you, did you end up quitting your job and, and going all in? How, how long was it? You said 15 months or a year? Just about, yeah. And and, and for us, I mean, it was, a, there, there were a couple of things that, that made it a little easier. One, um, in the company that I was working uh, uh, for, um, you know, we had bit, we had hit a bit of a, a rougher patch, um, and so you know, candidly, I was probably going to get laid off anyway um, at some point just because of uh, you know, just headcount reduction, like necessity. Um, as well, though, you know, it was it was coming at a time, it, it, and it just it did just kind of work out this way where um, we were starting to gain more distribution. I found that you know, three out of my five business days were up at, you know, four or five AM to make these deliveries before I was going into work anyway. Um, and then yeah, I I'd say the biggest thing was just was getting to a point where I was like, okay, I either need to start putting more time into this because I, I can get more sales that way, or I need to not and figure out you know, like something else to do. Um, and yeah, you know, I think for every entrepreneur it's different. You know, some folks and and I don't think there's a a, a right or wrong here. Um, I often tell other entrepreneurs, oftentimes I tell other people who are going through this, it is likely one of, it probably the, it, it is possibly the hardest decision you'll ever make professionally um, because it's the one thing that's not rooted in logic. Um, a lot of times, whether it's choosing a certain job opportunity or for certain folks who went to certain, you know, uh, institutions like, you know, like certain elite institutions, you could kind of compare, you know, US news and world rankings, or if it was a bank, it's like, okay, there's a, an objective thing that says you should go to Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan over the other banks or things like that. This is the, the only time where it's actually completely illogical. Like if you actually try to apply logic and know what the failure rates are on startups, you just, you would never do it. So, um, you know, at some point it's just kind of what works for you. And um, for me, it was, yeah, I need to work myself to the bone, like get myself to the very last inch of the cliff and finally be like, okay, I now have to jump. Otherwise, like you're just in, you're just, you're never going to do it otherwise. Yeah, like you can't do both anymore. You've done, you, you just worked yourself too much to handle basically two full-time jobs essentially. Yeah. But the leap is scary. I mean, you know, especially for folks who might be listening to this, like, it's not like we had enough revenue to float even my rent. Um, you know, we weren't even at that point. So you, and I think the thing that I've learned, again, it may be different for food and beverage versus other verticals, but, um, you know, for food and beverage, like you don't usually get that. You don't usually get to a point in revenue where it's that strong to feel that good. Like you actually have to make the jump typically, um, at least in beverage a little bit earlier because it does require, um, it, it tends to require a lot of like field work, like being at stores, um, you know, shaking hands and well, not shaking hands anymore uh, during the pandemic, but uh, in general, yeah, yeah, like being out in the field. So, um, yeah, it can vary for a lot of people, but that was, you know, that was my path. Yeah, and I definitely want to go through the distribution side that you've kind of alluded to a little bit. But I, with that, your first customers, taking to the early days, we're still, we're going to progress till today, but in the early days, Getting your first customers, your first sales, what did that look like? How did you go about that? I mean, it's still how I do a lot of it today, which is cold, like cold outreaches. Um, in, uh, it's a little different now that we have some distribution, but in the earliest days when you have nothing, um, the best thing you can do is literally just walk into a place. Um, especially, and I'll say specifically for food and beverage, and you're targeting like a boutique market, a lot of folks will try to email in. And I've seen firsthand in this industry, this is very much an in-person or phone call driven business. Um, 
yeah, it, it, like email obviously huge for bigger accounts, but the easiest way that um, entrepreneurs can validate their their product is by walking straight in. And frankly, it's something that a lot of people won't do. So, um, you know, probably the easiest thing that I would just recommend is just getting out in the field. Um, after that, it's yeah, talking one on one. You know, again, it's a, it's a lot tougher now during the pandemic, but um, for us it, for, and for me, it was um, you know when we did get a couple of first customers who did just buy in, and literally what that means was I showed up with samples, asked to speak to the key buyer or decision maker, and pitched them on the spot, um, and then they said yay or nay, and obviously got a lot of no's, but got you know my first couple of yeses. The product goes on the shelf. And then the key is not just getting it on the shelf, but getting it off the shelf. So supporting that with um, in at the, when you could do them in person customer demos. So literally, uh, there's a market in uh, in Chelsea on 22nd and 22nd and 8th Avenue that I would go into on a Monday and Tuesday night and pour samples of Sanzo, and they would sip it if they liked it. A lot of them went a lot of it because they were talking to the founder and there's some social pressures there that you can take advantage of. Um, and they would go and physically buy the product and you just kind of create initial momentum um, that way. It's, it's as, it is as um, unsexy as it sounds in the earliest days. <laughs> With that as well. So how did you decide then which, which retailers are going to go into or distribution partners you're going to work with? Because that's something where, again, there's so many different options potentially, but it's a little more of a niche market. So how did you think about that for your company? Yeah, I mean, we didn't. We knew, especially with what I, I kind of talked to you before about the need to be very buttoned up when you're approaching a Whole Foods type of retailer. Um, you know, we wanted to frankly make our mistakes at the, at, you know, at, at, at the smaller independent markets. And a lot of these folks... I mean, they're they're I mean, they're, they're the lifeblood to the the food and beverage industry because they see it as their jobs to take chances on new food and beverage brands, and their customers go there to discover you know the new like the very newest um, and earliest brands. Uh, so you know, part of it was just kind of walking around the city, and then uh, I'll tell you one thing that I did was I would go into one of these markets look at the brands that were already on shelf and just cold outreach those Instagram accounts. You know, most of them had way less than 10,000 Instagram followers. Most of those brands, you know, it's the founders who are running it. Um, and a lot of these folks are down to talk. And in many ways, if they're on that shelf, that means that they also probably started within the last, um, I'll say within the last three years. And so we're just definitely more open to having these kinds of conversations. So um, I, would recommend that to folks who are getting into it. And if you want, like, you know, developing basically a, an early lead list, um, you know, I got that from one of these outreaches, and they were like, "Yeah, I'll give you, you know, three to five stores you know, that I think you should target, and kind of go from there." Um, it's the same five, to, same three to five stores that I tell other people when they hit hit us up. So um, it, it is a very, um, as, as much as it's very competitive. Uh, because you are literally, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a fixed amount of shelf space. Um, you, this industry actually does tend to be quite collaborative. Um, and, 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 and that is one thing that I actually do really like about um, the natural food and beverage world. Is that it, it, a lot of folks are quite collaborative, but um, I, th I think it is worth folks knowing like, you know, where to, where to start, you know, asking the right questions. Yeah, get the foot in the door, at least. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. From that point then, so that early distribution, obviously you're getting your first customers, you're cold outreach and you still do cold outreach, but how have you shifted the distribution as you've grown? So have you gotten kind of that first validation and then grown from there? And so it's still pretty new, but I'm curious as how, how the progression of kind of distribution has gone for you as time has gone on. Yeah. And again, people will take different paths. Frankly, a lot of people probably, what I, what I have done is probably step like, like people just bypass it. Um, altogether, they may raise more more money up front and you know already get a distributor on board. I went the very um, you know build it brick by brick type of approach. Um, but so how it worked for us was, you know, we had our first you know 10, 15, 20 doors at this point, I guess, um, with that method, me just walking in um, and also self delivering the product. At some point, which worked out well for us each of those stores was selling through a good amount of product every week. So I was spending my time you know, in the mornings, like doing more deliveries than I wanted to. And so when you're doing deliveries, you can't sell because that's, you know, you can only, you can only be in one place at one, at one time. 
Um, but what that does though, is you can then approach a distributor saying, Hey, we already have this book of business. If you want to take it on, you like, here it is. You, this is free sales. You're, you're already going, um, you know, to these doors delivering, you know, these other products. We're just giving you revenue and um, distributors like that. Distributors like when you do their work for them. So um, that's how we got our first distributor. And in many ways, that's kind of how it still works. Uh, you're just going, you're just leveling up with each with each one. And saying your approach, you know, going brick by brick though, to that point, why did you decide to go that route versus another? Because there's always like many options. There's a thousand different decisions you make in a business, which way to go, bigger VC money, not, you could go self-funded, you could do, there's like so many different ways. And I'm always curious with different entrepreneurs, like how how you personally decide, how did you decide to go about you did? I guess I just, you know, it may be, you know, I, I'm a child of immigrants. My parents immigrated here from the Philippines in the eighties. And um, gosh, I learned like really the value of a dollar. And so for me, it was, I don't feel comfortable asking folks for money, especially not having grown up in, you know, super, like super privileged circles. I, I ended up going to a pretty privileged, uh, you know, college, but, um, you know, my own network was not, you know, crazy like that. And so before I could even ask those folks for money, I was like, well, I better put my own skin in the game um, because folks would feel it. Uh, you know, the earliest supporters would feel it if I asked them for money. So um, it, it's just kind of what I could afford or was even willing to do. I just, I didn't feel comfortable even pitching or asking for money unless I knew a little bit more about what I'm doing. And I do think that that's actually made me, you know, better just, I mean, both business owner, fundraiser, all of that now, because I went through that. And again, some people, that's not their journey. And obviously it's fine, right? Like uh, it, no judgment, you know, people grow the business, grow the business the way that they need to. Um, I just feel, felt like for my own path, my own journey, um, I just, I, I wanted, I wanted to know, I wanted to learn. Um, so yeah. <laughs> well, and then eventually you raised 1.3 million, uh, last year. Take me through that process then R fundraising, how you decided who to bring on board in terms of your investors. I'm curious about that. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting was my goal was to actually only raise 600,000. Um, and I feel very fortunate that I was actually able to raise the one three because we've needed, uh, yeah, we definitely, it, it was definitely advantageous to have it, especially during the pandemic. So I'll say, you know, that round got published, uh, I guess it was Forbes in uh, like July or August of 2020. Um, truthfully, that round took a, probably about seven to nine months to put together. Um, so, it, and it's interesting because, you know, I started out trying to raise 600, was doing very terribly at that. And then all of a sudden it got, the round got hot and I raised 1.3 in about six weeks. Um, just to kind of show you the volatility that can occur in a fundraising round. So. Um, you know, I was still going in the earliest days, just my own very like, you know, kind of bootstrap self-financing type of mentality. Um, but, you know, got to a point where I was starting to be stretched for dollars. And so opened up, uh, you know, we did it through a, a, a convertible note round. Um, fortunately had some friends put in the first, you know, maybe like 50, 75 K. Um, and then we did get, a, a basically he was an early customer. Uh, his name is Scott Belsky. Um, chief product officer at Adobe, yeah, very prominent angel investor. At the time, uh, I would literally look up all of my customer customers. So, um, you know, when I got a Shopify, you know, get the Kaching, I'm like, just curious. You know, we weren't getting a ton of orders, so I'm always, and it is my first time running a business, so I'm like, hey, this is cool. Like, who is this person? Um, and uh, obviously, no, I mean, I knew who Scott Belsky was just because I, yeah, I, I'd been in technology, and so reached out to him uh silly silly me like i didn't find his investment website so i actually asked him hey scott do you invest and now it's like that was the dumbest question ever because obviously he, he invests um but so he came on you know that brought in a couple other folks but we actually i mean i'll be honest like, we did hit another um lull the biggest thing that really spurred it on was around um may i want to say um, and this was in the middle of the pandemic, you know, it was really bad times. Um, Jen Rubio came on, who was the co-founder of Away. And between her and, and, and Scott, um, you know, they both just have a lot of trust and like their networks, like they, you know, fortunately the switches started flipping on, on the networks. And then the round just got like, I'll, I'll tell you this, the, like the first like 
call, like maybe call 200,000, maybe took me five months. The last 1.1 million took me six weeks um, and probably could have even happened quicker than that. The problem was like, I was still the only employee. So I was still like having to like run the business and put up the numbers that we needed to, you know, validate, you know, what we were doing and then also go fundraise. So um, quite a stressful time during the summer. Um, I, it was, th that was like, yeah, I had to really kind of dig deep on that one. Um, but uh, it was, we got, we got through it <laughs> and, you know, what type of feedback were you getting from from Jen and Scott like when they you know, obviously they became investors? They've done a number of investments, uh, some higher profile. Like, what were they saying about why they invested in you? It was brand and brand potential. They were like, "We think this product basically like it hits," and also they they saw where I was going with building community and well, building community, and that that community itself was already a, 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 that that a, a, a significant portion of that community had like high purchasing power, but was significantly um, underrepresented. So basically long and short of it was, you know, us being an Asian inspired product. If you look at uh, just how much like the, the, the API uh, purchasing power, plus how much of it we spend on our demographic spends on brands and how much we over index on like social media. So essentially like you're creating your initial word of mouth flywheel, like, the early uh, rumblings were there if you if you created the right product and then marry that with the macro trends that you know we all had seen and that I you know talked about with you know crazy rich Asians and all this other stuff um, it just kind of created that um, that marriage that we weren't that we we both had an initial tribe of Asian Americans but that the broader American populace was also um, it, it was open to that population as well. So, um, and then look, like ultimately, you know, I had to convince them that I was a good, that I could be a good steward of, of capital, um, that I could build a good team. Um, you know, we're going, especially through the team building process right now. Um, actually, we're wrapping up another fundraising round right now. So as a, especially in beverage, you know, one of the things as well is can this person just continue to raise money because you do need to raise a decent amount of money to, to keep the lights on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you want other specifics, maybe you know, maybe you could ask. Uh, maybe I'll get you to ask Jen and Scott. But um, I think those are the I think those are the primary the primary things. No, it's it's good to provide that context. I think it's for other entrepreneurs. It's like why did someone why did they why was he able to convince them to invest? Because it's such a difficult journey. I've talked to people who have taken a few weeks to raise funding, and I've talked to people who've taken ten months to raise funding, and it is. For the most part, it takes months and months and months, and a lot of no's along the way to get funding for any company. You know, whether it be a smaller, you know, pre-seed or seed round, whether it be people even raising Series A, Series B, it doesn't even get easier necessarily. It's just different uh, because once you get a Series A, then it's like, okay, well, are you hitting your metrics that you needed to hit to get there? You know, so it's all these different things. It's still difficult, and regardless of along the process. So I appreciate the context and a couple of things you said there stood out to me. One being the community aspect of it. How have you kind of thought about community? building community within as you're as you're building your company and how does that play a part into it you kind of alluded to it already but i'm curious as to anything else you've intentionally done to really build community around it yeah i mean so as, as you might imagine you know the first um logical tribe for us to try to build is you know is the asian american demographic which um you know i kind of alluded to the the, the dynamics there um but you know for us it's not enough to just create a product and sell it to this community right um i uh you know growing up actually um you know worked in, in in the food service like space and i've always had an infatuation and like such a respect for people who um who work in the, who work in the industry um and so one of the earliest things that we did uh and i mean it was both a business decision and also a brand a brand and brand marketing decision was really trying to partner up with um, the Asian inspired concepts and restaurateurs in New York City. So, um, you know, on the business side of it, it was, hey, we can sell our product here and we're not having to compete on the shelves of Whole Foods that can cost, you know, that can you know, have more marketing dollars uh, needed to, to, you know, to pump up sales. You know, you're sitting in an environment um, where people are more naturally predisposed to consuming your product. And that's awesome. Um, and the other part of that too is, you know, there's cross marketing potential, right? So, you know, restaurateurs, the actual restaurants themselves, people love following, you know, if you look at their feed, these folks' feeds, 
um, you know, uh, chefs are generally going to be much more famous than beverage entrepreneurs. And I'm totally cool with that. But um, how do we, but then, you know, these folks are also looking for other ways to cross promote. So, um, you know, tapping into that early was a very, was a very deliberate decision. But also uh, on a personal note, again, uh, being so, um, I, I, I love the industry. And once COVID hit, and we saw how how um, you know how that industry got struck. You know, we we did make it a very made made a very intentional decision to invest even more heavily um, into the industry. So I I do like to say you know, for our team, you know, we were among the first to start really contributing to um, you know employee funds when those folks were furloughed, um, especially. Um, especially the back of house employees who are typically undocumented immigrants. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that, you know, that, that their families um, you know, could still, uh, you know, rely on them for even just, you know, rent, food, things like that. I mean, during the months of March, April, and May, it was pretty rough. Um, and so, you know, we're really proud of what we, you know, of the investments that we made there. Um, and, 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 and I'll say coming out of hopefully the pandemic in the next um, couple of months, uh, you know, we've seen that community give it, you know, give it, give it back to us, both the restaurant community, the Asian American community, um, and then other folks who just like support those, you know, those communities as well. So um, it's, it's been uh, incredibly heartwarming over the last year, just to see how many people just, um, you know, resonate with what we're doing. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're committed to kind of continuing to pass it, pay it forward. Yeah. And that's, that's one aspect of, of brand really is the community that you actually built around that. But then also with, in the beginning, even thinking about how you differentiate yourself as a product, especially looking at limited shelf space and how do you stand out to someone who's just passing by and going to pick up this product? How did you think about the, the actual brand from that perspective, like visually how this would look and what do you want to portray as people are seeing this? Like, how did you think about that side of things for the company? Yeah. I mean, you are, I'll say you're, you're seeing it even more now that folks are developing. I mean, my, I had a, I had like a, what I call like the, 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 the point three second test that if you're scrolling on your Instagram feed, um, you know, very likely someone's attention you might have for 0.3 seconds. And can you get that person's thumb to stop when they hit your photo before they keep scrolling? Um, and so, you, you know, I, I will say I, I'm actually surprised there are still so many, I think, food and beverage brands who miss this. You know, you see an ad on Instagram and you're like, oh, I can't read that um, or, or, or whatnot. Um, and then, and that translates to a shelf also. I mean, I, I, there's a, I will also say another test that I employed was there was a store down in Tribeca on Canal Street. And I wanted to, the little test that I had was if I'm walking on the sidewalk and, and the, the place had like a glass door so you could see straight into it. My test was I should be able to look in and with, and know, and whatever I need to associate with, I need to be able to know that that's mine. And so for us, those are deliberate decisions on the orientation of our word mark going more vertical versus the traditional horizontal, making the fruit illustration um, you know, a little bit larger, obviously going with like more pastel-y colors. And then even from a font perspective, um, making sure the font was big enough that you could read it. But then overall, just like, was this an image that you could just see as being unique enough um, on a shelf? And at, at least right now, it's so far so good. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you also see a number, I mean, we're not the only one. There are a number of brands that I would already call, um, you know, if not already there, then like very much on the border of like iconic in their, in their packaging design. And, you know, I think past those same um, eye test rules and is in my, in my opinion, why you're, why the, at least part of the reason why those brands are doing so well, because brand discovery, even for as much as we all talk about, um, you know, our Instagram feeds and creating communities, so much brand discovery is still happening at the store when you're just going through the aisles and you're like, that thing looks interesting and you pull it off the shelf and put it in your cart. It's just, for many, for many people, it's still as simple as that. With that as well, then what type of like testing or how often have you tested the different, as, as the packaging evolved where you tested before you actually obviously roll it out because you can't, you're going to make a, a certain number of quantity, a certain quantity of the product and you can't just change it. But like, how did you test it or how have you tested it along the way or has it evolved uh, since you first started? Yeah, so actually, our very first iteration of the of the product was in a glass bottle. Um, 
a lot of that was on purpose from an operational perspective. So, I mean, not to get too into the weeds here, but um, typically, a, a, typically a minimum um, canning run, if you're going to run a product in cans, tends to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 cans per 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 SKU per unit per, per flavor. Um, and if you're doing glass bottles. Uh, it can actually you can actually find um, contract manufacturers who will do as little as like 500. So um, yeah, so if you're looking to truly like you know MVP your uh, your idea, you know glass bottles are typically a good way to start. Now a couple of things that we learned: one, um, the product in a glass bottle, um, while interesting, uh, made people think of of sodas because we had a color we, we, we had color. So a lot of questions that we would get were like, hey, is there a lot of sugar in this? Um, so uh, for a, for multiple reasons, that being one of them, uh, it's a good thing that we were able to get to a scale enough that we were we, we knew we wanted to get the cans pretty quickly. Um, but one of the other things there too that we learned was if you in, in our very first iteration, we did not actually have any functional callouts. So if you look at our can um, on the front face, it says made with real fruit, no added sugar. Um, both of those callouts were directly from. Um, uh, customer samplings. So oftentimes those would be the more than, and I was surprised this is my first time doing it, even more than calorie count, folks would ask, is this thing real fruit? And is there any added, is there any added sugar in here? And so, um, you know, those have still been actually some of the biggest costs we get on digital. Um, you know, when, again, we, we don't do any in-person demos, but, um, you know, when we get like emails that come in, like those are, those are still the questions that are asked. And so by us putting it on the front of the can, um, you know, it does allow us to address it, you know, like upfront, which I think is also helped with, I don't know, conversion rate or however you want to, however you want to measure it. Yeah. And, and from that too, then, so looking at, you went from retail and then going direct to consumer, it's a little bit different. Uh, I mentioned Instagram ads and everything as well with that. At what point did you decide to sell direct to consumer? Was that from the beginning? When we got into cans, we were, we had like a website. I did not invest super heavily into it because well, one, it's, a, it's a kind of crazy to say this, but like a year ago or sorry, like a year and a month ago, buying beverages direct to consumer was still not that big of a thing. I mean, you know, maybe companies like recess got away with it, um, you know, because of their type of offering and, you know, and whatnot, but for the most part, a, like a, like a, a, a traditional, um, even upstart CPG company, just or beverage company just wasn't really able to do it. Um, so yes, I would pack orders in my apartment for people who place orders, but I wasn't really advertising that much. Also, we didn't have that big of a budget. Um, but then once the pandemic hit, um, you know, I, so in my last job, I used to be a head of growth. So spent a lot of money on Facebook and Instagram ads, um, noticed, you know, basically overnight, once New York City hit sh uh, shelter in place, CPMs just fell off the off a cliff because of how much ad budget was being pulled. And so it was, if there's one thing that my last job did teach me well, I was like, ooh, okay, we have a good read on CPMs. Um, this might be a really good arbitrage opportunity to acquire new customers very cheaply. And, you know, that did prove to be pretty good for a lot of us who were able to take advantage of it. Um, but, and then now, again, we're super fortunate that, um, you know, these, consu these consumption habits have persisted, you know, whether it's on Amazon or your own uh, owned and operated direct consumer website, folks are now willing to spend more money on groceries than they did before the pandemic. It has fallen off from the, from the, the, the peak pandemic levels, but the new baseline is still significantly higher. So, um, you know, if you're looking for that first million dollars in revenue, um, that's, that, that's actually a channel now that is wild to say that was not there literally as recently as 14 months ago. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's insane to think about how fast things can change. Well, with a one once in a generation global pandemic, but uh, it, things can change quickly. And one thing is we haven't really discussed yet is with the product itself. You mentioned the different SKUs, which are different flavors. How do you feel about that? Just in terms of like how many different flavors you wanted to offer at the beginning, and then you know how you want to expand on those. Because again, that's if you're making a minimum order per SKU. I mean, that changes things. So, like, how have you thought about that side of the business? We knew that for a flavored sparkling water line, the minimum you needed to go out with was three. Was was really three flavors, um, and you know there are reasons why I picked the specific fruits that I did. Basically, the calamansi, which is if you've never had it before, it's like a Filipino lime um, for your listeners. Uh, imagine a lime and an orange having a baby together. It's literally 
uh, lime on the outside, you cut it open and it's it's orange, but it's still so tart with a little bit of sweet. Um, the lychee was more floral, and then the mango is is sweeter. Um, so you know, as as far as the the, the, the initial uh, launch, um, yeah, you just you need three. Um, at the same time, to that point, you know, you don't want. I, I don't. I didn't feel like I wanted to create more operational difficulties by having so many SKUs. And you know, fortunately, uh, all three of our SKUs sell quite well. They just, they, they sell they sell well in, dif in different channels. Um, but we're actually we we usually produce pretty close to like equivalent amounts during um, during each run, and you know what I what I've what I've come to learn is usually folks go into R and D and release new SKUs uh, early on when one is a, or when one or multiple SKUs are just completely falling flat. Um, fortunately, we don't have that problem, and um, you know when I think about the business, a lot of how I th uh, how I've thought about it is um, you know that marginal dollar. Is right now is probably best spent on us either um, gaining more distribution um, or you know continuing to boost the sales of our existing SKUs versus the R and D that goes into a new SKU. Now that said, as we're penetrating retail, that is changing a bit. You know, we we actually just began R and D for three new flavors, um, and that and there's some and there are retail related reasons why it's important to continue to 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 invest in in in, in um, in, in flavor development, um, but you know, I, 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 I would really caution um, entrepreneurs who are, uh, you know, I would say sub a million dollars in revenue um, to really uh, stay focused on their core SKUs before expanding too much. And even for us, when we think about new flavor development, you know, we view each of these flavors as a card to play with a retailer. So, you know, if we want to launch with so-and-so, it's something we can give them either some level of exclusivity or just or just novelty. What we've learned is buyers just really like to feel like they're being given something new. And so if you just come out of the gate with all these flavors and you, you lose you, you, you lose those cards. And so we've been pretty deliberate about how we're releasing new flavors. And that's something I, I remember talking to. Um talking to the founder of Healthy Kombucha, uh, we talked about how they get, were developing new flavors. And like over time, obviously you start with a few, then expanding, you're always going to expand, even like different types of drink options as well, which is interesting to see how um, the evolution of that company has gone. They, they're like a hundred million dollar revenue company or something crazy. Uh, yeah, they're just crushing it. Uh, and it's funny to see the evolution versus a smaller company. And even like then I've seen other retail, other companies getting into retail with, um, with a cookie dough company. It was another thing where it's like looking at how they expanded to different, different regions and different uh, stores and everything. It's just kind of fascinating to me, the whole food space. Um, something that's, yeah, even on the investor side, we're investing in, in tech and B2B tech uh, software, I should say. But like, it's still fun to hear like the consumer, like CPG companies and everything as well. And one thing you mentioned with, with growth, you've grown a, a bit already, obviously looking at raising their funding round, but you mentioned the hiring side, something you're doing now. So on the hiring front, it started with you for a long time, like just you basically for a significant amount of time. How has the hiring gone for you? What's been helpful for you along the way as you've been building a team? Sure. I mean, in the earliest days, I will say um, the methodology that I applied was basically around pain. Um, if I'm feeling pain and like, you know, like my first few hires were just like, I can't, it was literally a point, I can't do this anymore. Um, I'm like, it is like detrimental to the brand, to the business, to my own personal self to keep doing all of this. And so what are the things we can first, um, you know, hand off? Or I'll even say this, like, what are the blind spots that I'm missing that could actually set me up for failure um, down the line that I can't see yet? And I think especially one of the lessons I've learned in CPG is, and it's probably similar to, um, you know, the, the companies that you may fund in enterprise SaaS, um, you know, the, the bigger the enterprise, the longer the sales cycle. Um, and in a similar way with CPG, um, everything has a very long cycle, manufacturring, um, sales and whatnot. And so, you know, a mistake you might make right now, you may not know, you know, until a couple months down the line, that's kind of daunting. Um, and that actually multiplies as you get bigger, because when you're going from, you know, if you think about it, like independent natural foods to one region of whole foods to, let's say at the biggest, you know, level a Walmart, a Costco, uh, whatnot, like those take like a, a, an even longer period of time. And so 
um, where I'm going with this is that like in the beginning it was solving for pain. Um, what do I most, what do I feel most acutely now, especially as, you know, as we now have investors, it's now solving for like opportunity. So where am I actually like sub-optimized as a, as a founder CEO, um, where someone can come in and either do it more professionally or just like, or there are perhaps a bit more rote tasks that I should just get myself out of the business of doing so I can focus on strategic sales, um, strategic marketing, um, fundraising, um, you know, helping my head of ops and finance, like lay down the operations um, pipeline. And so it's an interesting focus change. That's a, I can feel the change that's occurred. It's wild because I, I literally raised this round last summer. We're raising the other round now. So it's only been like six months or so, but like, literally already feeling um yeah uh, sorry we're, we started raising at the beginning of the year we were just kind of finished up so um yeah like that six to eight months like just how quickly that can that, that that focus can shift so we're at five full time um but we currently have eight open positions that we just posted we just posted a week and a half ago four of them are full time four of them are for summer interns um, that we hope a couple of them may turn into, you know, can, can convert into full times. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's wild. As we're wrapping up fundraising, we're now gearing up the, uh, the recruitment process. <laughs> so it never, it never stops. <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah. Keep growing more and more. And, and for you then, like you mentioned not having experience in this industry came in kind of fresh, but having that, having like immigrant parents, the work ethic and really trying to be frugal with the money and make it last, like what's been helpful for you as a founder? Like, who have been either your mentors or how, you know, it's, there's so many unanswered questions as you're starting a company for you, like what's helped you through this last couple of years of growing the business? Yeah. I mean, it is both. So I'll say this. I mean, what, once we finished raising the round um, at the, at, at the recommendation of people that I, that I very much trust, um, you know, I got advisors on the sales side of the business and on the operation side of the business. And I'll be pretty like candid. One of them is more on a retainer basis. The other one, it was a slight equity deal um, that vests and all that kind of jazz. Um, the two best investments I have made, um, they have taught me um, the industry um, from both a sales and operational perspective in a way that um, I could not have gotten otherwise. And it certainly would have not been, we, maybe, the better way to say it, maybe the better way to say it is, I don't think I could have deployed capital, whether it's cash or equity, in a more efficient way that multiplied my knowledge base as a founder than to get the right advisors. And um, I would recommend, and, and that was a, that's a big recommendation that I would give to, to other aspiring entrepreneurs is like, and it, it depends on your cap table. I'd say certainly if you're a solo founder, like the way I was, um, you know, equity is the best tool that you have. Um, it can be a moat um, to, 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 to attracting the best talent. Um, and certainly, yeah, getting the best advice. And so um, I would say that, but, but what I would also say is for myself, being in the field uh, allowed me to ask, I think, really good questions. Um, and I have very much kept a beginner's mentality and mindset when I hop on the phone with them. Um, even this, I will say that like, we have a, you know, a, a, a salesperson on our team who is a bit more experienced, uh, I will admit. And so when we talk about certain distributor um, relationships or retailer relationships, I will straight up ask him for his, his thoughts and his opinions because he, he will have worked with them before. Um, and, and Hey, that's why, you know, we brought him onto the team was because he can give you know, that kind of guidance. And so, um, yeah, it is the balance of like knowing how to trust people, but then also like challenging them too. you know, asking them questions because it's, it's, it's important to not just take anything at face value. Um, so I don't answer. I don't answer your question, but yeah, basically getting the right advisors. <laughs> Which is huge. I mean, like I said, equity is a, something you can deploy to help that in terms of getting the right people on board. And that's something I think about at Vitalize in terms of why people accept, for instance, we have right now at least uh, Irish Angels, which is an angel group and as well as a fund. And so it's like, why does someone work, want to work with an angel group? A lot of times it's depending on who those people are in the group. If we can get the right people, it can be really helpful for them versus also getting individual angels can be really helpful in the early stages as well. Uh, and then you look at even some later rounds where people still are bigger rounds of fundraising they'll bring in or have an allocation for some angels who are strategic and can help them and advise them in some way where they don't already 
have that expertise or that knowledge, um, which if you're taking a smaller check can be worth it too. Like it's it all depends on what you're looking, I'm looking for out of it. And, and with this, as we kind of wrap things up, what's been most helpful for you in terms of helping you unwind and kind of step away, uh, make sure you can kind of play the long game and continue this company. Yeah. I mean, I feel very, uh, very fortunate, very blessed, um, to have a very loving fiance, um, who, yeah, who, I mean, for anyone who, who does startups and has a significant other, I mean, you know, that they're, the, they're the ones who keep it together while we're often, you know, kind of going crazy. Um, and then I'll say too, like, if I'm being honest, the last year, you know, going through this pandemic, I think if it hasn't given you the proper perspective on what's like really important in life, then you'll have missed out on, I think, a pretty key lesson. I'm not saying that, um, you know, the pandemic serves to be um, a lesson for us all, but, uh, you know, if you can take any, if you can try to create, make, make anything positive um, out of what's been just a very terrible time, um, you know, I think that's one thing that I would say I, I, I've taken away. So, you know, I, I, I've gotten a little bit better, although I think they would probably dispute this at, you know, calling my parents, um, you know, talking to my family, um, talking to, talking to like close friends. Um, you know, fortunately also have, I'm, I'm 33 right now. And a lot of my friends, um, you know, during the pandemic are married and just recently started families of, of their own. And so just having that perspective to just realize that, you know, I think, I think when we're all in this game, we all know, and I think we all have to, and we all, you know, we have to go like, I think if you're going for it, like you have to go for it. Like there's, there's no, um, you know, it, it's really hard, I think, to create anything of substance this quickly if you're not working very hard and, it's a, and at times very long hours. I, I think it's very, I, I think it's a hard thing to, to accomplish. Um, at the same time, you know, being able to have people around you who can give you that kind of perspective on what's really important in life um, is, a, is big. Like, you know, the opportunities that I get to have now as an entrepreneur, um, you know, the conversations I get to have, sometimes looking at the bank account that we have as a, as a business, I'm like, I've never even fathomed of, you know, of us having that kind of, um, that kind of capital. I mean, it's still a pittance compared to what even certain emerging brands have, but, uh, you know, it's important to just keep it, keep everything in its proper perspective is probably the best thing that I would, that that's worked for me. And then sure, at times it's, I don't know, getting a good workout in, punching something, um, you know, like a, like a, some kind of, I don't know, pillow or a punching bag or something uh, can be super helpful too, and especially with the weather getting better. Um, you know, that, that, that's a good thing. <laughs> One of the last questions I have is just what is next for, for Sanzo? I mean, I'll say this, like our, so our mission long-term to get, not to get too philosophical again, but it's, our mission is to bridge cultures by connecting people with global flavors, uh, by, 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 with authentic flavors. Sorry. Um, I really believe like my whole, my, my, my thesis, why I've decided that this is what I want to pursue in life um, is that whether it's, uh, like I, I, I believe this beverage should be both in, in, in New York and in Shanghai and, and in Los Angeles, and also frankly, in like the center of the country. Um, and so, you know, as a, from a distribution standpoint, from a brand story, from a brand and storytelling standpoint, um, I am just very like fired up about the idea that we get to like, you know, educate folks about, about these new flavors or for folks in the API community, um, you know, help them, you know, quote unquote, like feel seen. Um, I just, and, and, and so, you know, whatever those like actual like financial metrics, um, you know, finalize that, you know, that's obviously, you know, we obviously have things that we're trying to get to, but from a more qualitative standpoint, it's like, can we actually make a dent in bridging cultures? Um, especially at a time right now when you're seeing, um, you know, increased um, uh, incidents of anti-Asian sentiment and, and hate crimes. Um, you know, I still, I still remain honestly pretty optimistic about where we're going long term. Um, you know, I think there's still a lot of pent up frustration or negative sentiments. Um, but overall, like I, what, what I go with is brands like Sanzo could not have existed even as recently as like five years ago. And the reason it, 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 you know, I think my brand can exist now is because of a, a lot of, because of a lot of the work that's been done by folks, you know, before us, whether they be, um, you know, activists or creatives in, you know, TV, film, what, what you know, uh, the culinary arts, like everywhere, what have you. Um, 
And so I do believe that, you know, the folks coming, you know, after us will have the same dynamic because of, you know, the, you know, the brands that, you know, like myself and like other folks who are in my like class um, of, of new CPG brands have created. And so, you know, it's a, I, I, I stay very optimistic um, on, on, on that. And so like what's forward, you know, what, what's next for us is just, you know, con- trying to continue to push the ball forward, um, trying to make the, 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 the CPG industry um, a more inclusive one, trying to make the shelves that you shop at a more inclusive one. Um, that's, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't, the great thing about it, honestly, why I'm excited about this is that like, I'll wrap up on this. Sorry, I'll shut up. But it's like, I don't think, I don't think we will, I don't think I'll actually accomplish it in my lifetime. Like, I think we're still going to be fighting this um, for still generations to come. And for whatever reason, like the masochist in me, that gets me excited and like, and, and gets me inspired to do this every day. It's like the knowing that I will probably not get there um, is just like interesting. <laughs> yeah. But what if, but what if you do <laughs> at the same time? <laughs> yeah. And Sandra, what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you if they want to? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, probably I would say uh, on a personal level, my Instagram handle, um, it's at Alessandro Rocco. That's A-L-E-S-S-A-N-D-R-O. R-O-C-O. Um, that's my handle on both Instagram and on Twitter. Um, LinkedIn's also pretty good too. I tend to, I tend to be pretty, I, I tend to be weirdly active there. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. Love it. And for people who want to check it out online as well, drinksanzo.com. I'll link everything in the show notes as well. Just go grind.com slash podcast. But Sandro, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Thanks for having me.